Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 10th and final research seminar in the UCD School of Agriculture and Food Science Research Seminar Series. Um, just to uh, quickly, uh, I suppose, wrap up the series this year, we've, uh, it's been very successful. Uh, moving to a virtual uh, format has worked very well. Um, all of the seminars are available on YouTube. Um, there have been more than 500 registrations uh, across uh, the academic year for the 10 seminars. And uh, the, the videos will remain on YouTube uh, for anyone to watch um, over, over, the, over the next year or two. Okay, so today we're delighted to welcome um, Associate Professor Kieran Mead. Um, Kieran is actually an alumnus of the school, graduating in 2000 uh, with a degree in animal science, um, after which he completed a PhD in molecular genetics uh, on the human, uh, sorry, the immune response to tuberculosis in cattle. Um, after his PhD, Kieran moved uh, to St. Vincent's University Hospital and then on to Trinity College as a postdoctoral scientist working with Professor Clino Farrelly, a professor of comparative immunology in Trinity, and his work focused on infectious diseases in chickens and cattle. Um, Kieran was also appointed an adjunct assistant professor in immunology in Trinity, where he's lectured on an MSc in immunology for more than a decade. In 2009, Kieran started uh, as a research uh, officer in Chagask, uh, where he established his own research group at the Animal and Bioscience Research Department. Um, in 2020, last year, uh, we were delighted when Kieran joined um, the UCD School of Agriculture and Food Science as an associate professor and Conway Fellow in immunobiology. Kieran's interests lie in livestock molecular immunology and the work out today forms the basis for his talk today entitled Harnessing the Potential of Innate Immunity uh, in Cattle. Great, thank you very much, David. Um, I'll just share my screen here. Um, let's see if you're responding, just bear with me. you see that now, David? Yeah, it's starting up, Karen. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, David. Uh, 12 months into UCD, it's great to meet uh, some, some um, uh, additional members of the school, even 12 months in. Uh, hopefully we can meet in person sometime soon. So this is a great opportunity for me to kind of showcase my research and teaching interests. Um, so thank you for your time today. But I guess the last thing that people want is another immunology talk given the last 18 months, but at least uh, this one is on cows. Um, but it's, it is difficult to escape um, immunology at the moment. I mean, I came across this flyer yesterday, which I thought was particularly interesting because I've been, um, I've been waxing lyrical about immunology for the last 11 years in Chagas. And yesterday I see that Luke O'Neill, our most famous immunologist or one of our most famous immunologists in the country was addressing a Chagas conference on, on sustainable food systems. So immunology is everywhere at the moment and Luke's research is, is relevant to some of the things I'm gonna talk about today. So the title of my talk then is on harnessing the potential of innate immunity in cattle. Um, a focus or focusing on improving and, and harnessing innate immunity, uh, there are multiple reasons why you might want to do that. But one of the predominant reasons really, in my mind at least, is that the, a, a, a principal driver of antimicrobial resistance, which we all know is a huge global issue, is, is the usage or antimicrobial usage or AMU. So by supporting the immune system and understanding the immune system of the host in more detail, well then we can identify mechanisms to support that animal so it's more resilient, but also to support it so that it can, um, it can mount an effective and appropriate immune response and also that it can resolve its, its, its uh, response to infection more appropriately. So when we look at a field of, of cows, um, we, we are well used to the fact that we have multiple metrics on these animals now. We can record what we call multiple phenotypes. So if you want to understand from a weight gain point of view, we, can, we know the weights of these animals and we can record intakes and we can work out in interesting and relevant um, factors for selection of cattle, like feed conversion efficiency, for example. 
We can also record other phenotypes of agricultural relevance, such as milk yield, and we can also measure the components of milk, like milk fat and milk protein. We have, well, when we talk about the immune status of animals, we have comparatively very little information. There are some measurements that give you some insight, like somatic, somatic cell count. But in general, we can't identify if an animal is at risk of having an inflammatory disease or is at risk of being immunosuppressed, for example, um, until that animal develops clinical infection. So we need to focus more on, particularly on the innate immune response, and this is where my research program comes in. On the right-hand side of this slide here, you'll see the adaptive immune cells that, play, that, that regulate your adaptive immune response, and we're all hearing a lot lately, and if you've got your, your COVID vaccine, your B cells and your T cells are very active at the moment, producing antibodies and, and memory cells. However, I'm more interested in focusing on the innate immune cells on the left-hand side of this slide, like the neutrophils and the monocytes and the macrophages, which, 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 which are the first responders to infection. What distinguishes the innate cells from the adaptive cells is the innate cells can react more readily and, and immediately, whereas the adaptive cells are presented with antigen and they are told what to respond to. So that adaptive response is slower. The neutrophils and the macrophages are the types of cells that we might more commonly associate, say, with somatic cell count. When we hear a cow's somatic cell count has gone up, what, what it really means is that the numbers of neutrophils and macrophages in her milk have increased. However, there are other cell populations which we're interested in, who, which exist in the kind of interface between innate and, and immune cells. And an example here are, are, are gamma delta T cells, these little cells that I've shown on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. These gamma delta T cells are a unique cell population that link both, both innate and adaptive immunity. They're a particularly interesting cell type. I've been funded uh, recently to work on these cells and understand what role they play in infection. But they're a particularly interesting cell type because they exist at about 5% of lymphocytes in mice and in humans. But in cattle, and particularly in calves, these cells can represent up to 60% of circulating lymphocytes. So they're a very common cell type in calves, and we, don't, and we know very little about their um, immune function. The net effect of, um, of, of, of the outcome of infection is determined then by the combination of your innate and your adaptive immune system. And then the adaptive immune system has two arms, the antibody arm, which is the B cells, and the, and the cell mediated immunity, which is the T cell arm. So that's, that's uh, the, the, the sum of the innate of the immune response in a nutshell. However, an often overlooked cell type that's critically important that we understand its function is the epithelial cell. When we think about the majority of infections that we're interested in in livestock, we think of respiratory diseases, um, mammary, uterine infections, um, enteric diseases, or mammary infections. These organs and tissues are extensively coated with um, epithelial cell lining. So these cells are critically important to, um, to activating an appropriate immune response, but also regulating that immune response. Under normal healthy conditions, an animal or an individual might be, in under, might be under a homeostatic um, 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 situation where everything is in balance. But when you get disruption of the epithelial layers we see here in the middle of this slide, you get um, internalization of, of pathogens or components of different bacteria, which can lead to inflammation. Inflammation tends to have a negative reputation and indeed chronic inflammation is, is an issue. But inflammation plays important physiological roles as well. And we're interested in the role of the epithelial cell in determining this switch from what's called healthy or physiological inflammation to what's called pathological inflammation. And that pathological inflammation is critically important because that's what causes the tissue damage um, associated with uh, chronic inflammation. So when we want to understand, well, why is understanding the host immune response relevant to tackling livestock diseases? Well, there are three main areas. The understanding the host immune response can help us prevent infection to begin with. It can help us intervene early to uh, catch animals before the infection has progressed. And at that stage, obviously, intervention will be more successful and antibiotic usage will be, um, will be reduced. But also, um, in a nod to Luke O'Neill's work, we're interested in developing novel effective therapies that can um, support or augment or, or reduce inflammation in the host. Um, 
um, to, to, to improve disease outcomes. All of these interventions require or depend on, um, sorry, my slides are a bit slow there. Yeah, all, sorry, let's go back on there. All these interventions rely on a detailed knowledge of host immunity. And I would make the argument that despite being one of the most important phenotypes in agriculture, the immune response is a trait that we know least about. So since uh, I graduated in, in the year 2000 in animal science, I have been interested in the immune response. And this slide essentially summarizes the activation of an immune response or of an, an innate immune response in particular. And you can see the graphic shows the receptors on the surface of a cell membrane, which engage with a pathogen or a component of a bacteria like LPS, for example, and sets up this signaling cascade. And that signaling cascade results in the activation of genes and the activation of proteins. And those proteins compose the immune response. And the types and the levels of those proteins that are produced are critically important to how that immune response will, um, will, will, will pan out in terms of its efficacy, its duration, but also its resolution, because resolution of infection is critically important. So there are some important components here that we might point out, for example, the inflammasome. The inflammasome is a, you see at the bottom of the slide there with the red arrow, is a protein complex which um, cleaves or activates particular proteins which are involved in the activation of the immune response. And you can see on the right hand side there that the, at the top we have a protein called interleukin-1. And I won't introduce too much immunology terminology, but interleukin-1 is a particularly uh, potent inflammatory cytokine. So when we hear things like cytokine storms in the news and hyperinflammation, interleukin-1 invariably plays a very important role and is relevant to what I'm going to talk about later on. However, I'm going to start by talking about these host defense peptides, which are down the bottom of the screen here. And these are peptides that I have spent a considerable amount of my career working on to date. Okay. So the, the, the host defense peptides tie in under the first heading here, which is the prevention of infection. So ideally, what we would like to do is, is to prevent infection before it happens. And ideally, some of our research is looking at our ability to drive expression of these defenses or these host defense peptides um, by, by programming the immune system in the calf, for example, to reduce infection. So we know um, in ag sorry, let's go back a slide there. We know in agriculture that working with nature or in partnership with nature is, is the most sustainable solution. And what's what's amazing about these host defense peptides is um, they have been honed over the course of evolution to be very effective natural antibiotics. And they're expressed across mucosal surfaces. So animals and humans as well. We produce them in lots of different membranes and epithelial cells across our intestine, our reproductive tract, and so on. These are um, potent, um, uh, what, what originally were called antimicrobial peptides, and they were first identified for their efficacy against, anti, against bacteria. But we now know from recent literature that they also play an important role in, uh, against viruses. The way they're taught, taught to work is we see a lipid bilayer here from a bacterial membrane, and the peptides are covered in, in uh, red and blue. And these peptides are cationic or positively charged peptides. And what they, what they, the way they're taught to act is that they aggregate and form pores on the bacterial membrane, which causes leakage from the bacterial cell and death of the bacteria. However, more recent research has shown that there's actually a whole array of uh, mechanisms by which these peptides work. And they have anti-inflammatory roles as well as antiviral roles, as, as I mentioned, and also immunomodulatory roles which means that they can, um, they can induce maturation of cells, which, which is important for immunity as well. So we really look on them as kind of like a Swiss army knife of the immune system because they're so multifunctional. So we um, set about researching some of these um, um, genes in the bovine genome, and we've identified that these host defense peptides exist across four clusters, chromosome 8, 13, 23, and 27. On chromosome 13, we identified uh, a number of new gene members, which we found um, um, in cattle for the first time. And then on chromosome 27, we see that there's an expanded number of genes, which are copy number variable. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But in total, it seems like there's about 57 um, genes in the bovine genome. And um, some, of, some of the new discoveries were, were, were conducted by Paul Cormican 
and in, in Clean O'Farrelly's lab at the time. Okay. So when we found these new genes, we were interested in identifying what their function is. And as I mentioned, they were originally discovered as for, for being antimicrobial peptides. So we thought these may play a role in, in, in killing bacteria. And where in the animal does an extensive amount of bacteria reside? Well, obviously your first thought would be within the rumen, within the, within the intestine. But when we actually went and investigated a number of different tissue types, uh, we discovered that these genes were uh, preferentially expressed within the testes. And particularly, uh, sorry, that slide seems, seems particularly slow, but um, we, we, we looked at lots of different tissues, as you can see across the top of that graphic, lung, rumen, small intestine, large intestine. And we found that the majority of the, the newly discovered genes on chromosome 13 were expressed in the testes and particularly expressed in the epididymis, this long convoluted tube, which prepares sperm, sperm for fertilization. So we developed um, a lot of new tools and technologies to investigate this further. And we developed antibodies. And you can see we, the areas that have stained brown in, the, in this graphic, we can see that, that they're the areas that are expressing these novel peptides. So these are sections of the epididymis. And we can see that the epithelial cells in the epididymis are, are colored brown. They're expressing these defense and peptides. But also that the peptides are bound to the surface of sperm. In the lumen of the, of the epididymis here, you can see that there are sperm cells and the sperm cells are coated with the, with, with the, 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 with the defensin. And we saw that the, the defensin is actually expressed. We use an antibody here and the sperm fluoresces green. You can see that in the tail region, the caudal region of the epididymis, the sperm are fluorescing green because they're heavily coated in this protein. So that hadn't been showed, shown before. We went on then, because it looked like these genes may play a role in fertility, in collaboration with Sean Fair and UL and Pat Lonigan and UCD, we went on and did a large association study using phenotypic records on over 7,000 Irish AI bulls. And we identified a genetic haplotype in these defensins, which was associated with poor fertility. And then we also experimentally validated that. We were able to take semen from these bulls and, um, and uh, prove that the, the semen from low fertility bulls bound less well to epithelial cells in the, in the, in the uterus of the cow, which is an important uh, step before fertilization. So a couple of these molecules have been investigated uh, in human reproductive research, and they showed up, uh, up, up the top there, you can see that as sperm swim through the testes in the epididymis, they become coated in these defensins, and those defensins give them motility. And um, so the sperm are able to swim through cervical mucus more effectively. But what they also showed was actually the defensin also conferred significant antibacterial activity. And in men who carried mutations in these genes who had fertility problems, they were able to restore the ability of the sperm to swim and restore uh, the antibacterial activity by adding the defense in back. So this gives us, um, uh, uh, you know, um, this, this links the immune and fertility aspects of these molecules because they're also antimicrobial, but also gave us food for thought in, in terms of um, the role that these molecules may play in protecting the, the reproductive tract against infection. This was relevant because in association with the National Cattle Breeding Center, one of the areas of global concern at the moment, or one of the infection agents, is a, is a bacteria called Mycoplasma bovis. So New Zealand is undergoing a large culling program at the moment to cull uh, Mycoplasma bovis positive animals because there is no um, uh, control um, strategy or no, no effective control for Mycoplasma bovis at the moment. And the particular issue with Mycoplasma bovis is that it has no cell wall. And the vast majority of peptides uh, or of antibiotics that work against Mycoplasma bovis target the cell wall. So we don't have um, effective antibiotics. And this is an issue because recent research has shown that um, uh, semen can, can be a source of Mycoplasma bovis. So Mycoplasma bovis is responsible for a whole um, constellation of, of diseases, including mastitis. But obviously, you can understand that if, um, if uh, semen from a single positive bull is used in AI, it could potentially disseminate infection quite widely. So it's, it's, it's of concern. So we started testing our defensins, and we, this project is ongoing. We tested our defensins against Mycoplasma bovis. And you can see one of the peptides there in blue shows uh, promise in terms of its ability to kill 
um, mycoplasma bovis. We've gone on to test these peptides using sperm um, and the peptides don't negatively affect sperm function at all. So we think that one of these, one of the potential routes to application of these peptides is to use them in AI straws to reduce the amount of antibiotic and to provide protection against mycoplasma bovis. Uh, another project uh, that's recently started in my lab is we have a PhD student working on is on copy number variation in these defensing genes. So I mentioned on a previous slide that the chromosome 27 cluster is expanded in cattle. So copy number variation means that some individuals have more copies of a single gene. So you can see calf on top has genes A, B, and C, where the calf below has B and C, but also has multiple copies of gene A. And what's interesting from um, some of the research, some of the findings that we're finding is that um, some of the gene members, like defense in beta 5, for example, has between 8 and 22 uh, copies of, of, of a gene. So some individuals have eight copies of the gene, where other individuals have 22 copies of the gene. So you can imagine if we think like a single polymorphism or a single mutation may affect the phenotype of the animal. Well, if you have 14 extra copies of the gene, well, then it's likely that that's going to have a significant impact on the phenotype of that animal. So we're particularly interested in asking the question about whether or not if, you, if calves have a higher number of uh, antimicrobial peptide genes, well, do they have a better antimicrobial immune response? So we think the beta defensins, we wrote this review last or two years ago now, we think the beta defensins are playing a role in managing homeostasis, but managing uh, the microbiome. So they, 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 um, they essentially um, uh, prune our microbiome and maintain a healthy balance across mucosal surfaces. So we're interested in asking the question about if we can drive expression of these protective host defense peptides, can we use a mechanism like an intervention of some sort to drive increased expression of these antimicrobial peptides and therefore provide calves uh, with a, with, or, or cows with a better immune response? So we did actually find that one of the most active, uh, one of the molecules that is most active in driving our defenses is vitamin D. So vitamin, you can see here the graph of gene expression for one of our defensins, and up to 24 hours in bovine cells, we see that we get, um, we get a, quite a significant increase in defense and expression. Vitamin D has attracted a lot of attention since, uh, since the emergence of COVID. In the last couple of years, there's been over 4,000 papers published with vitamin D in the title. And it seems that uh, vitamin D has a, a whole suite of important um, functions in the immune system. Um, let's move on to the next slide here. So we set about trying to establish what vitamin D levels were in Irish cattle to know if there was room to, to supplement these animals and drive their defense and expression. So we, we looked at some a collaborator of ours works in the University of Florida, Corwin Nelson, and there's the vitamin D data on the top of the graph from his, his publications. And he shows across 12 different herds the levels of circulating levels of vitamin D in the serum of animals. When we looked, even though it's a very different production system, the immune requirements are likely to be the same between US cattle and Irish cattle. And we looked in some Irish animals, which are shown here on the bottom of the screen. And we use the same dotted line that he uses. He reckons that 30 nanograms from, from the human research and from the research in the US, they reckon that 30 nanograms per mil of serum is required for optimal immunity. So you see on the right hand side of the, of the bottom graph there, you can see that as animals go out to grass, their vitamin D levels will rise as you would expect because they're exposed to sunshine and there's more dermal synthesis of vitamin D. However, in early, early months and also late in the winter, the animals start to dip down below this 30 nanogram threshold. If you look at the graph on the left hand side on the bottom of the screen, you'll see that on one particular farm, 84% of the cows were below this 30 nanogram threshold in the immediate period post calving. So we think, um, so we're, we're exploring the physiological relevance of, of these levels of vitamin D. And we think that it probably do, they, they probably do have an immune relevance. And um, there's not a huge amount of research done in, in particularly in pasture based Irish cattle. But what research has been done internationally has shown that injecting vitamin D into the mammary gland of cattle, for example, um, modulates the immune response and re reduces somatic cell count. 
And also there's some older research that has stained the granuloma in tuberculosis infected cattle. And they've identified the brown stains on the right hand side of the screen there show that the granuloma contains vitamin D in, in TB infected cattle. So we think that this probably has wide, wide disease relevance. So we did a supplementation study last year, one of the few things we managed to, to, to do in the, in the year that it was. And uh, we, we supplemented animals with calves, with spring-born dairy calves with vitamin D. And the results are shown on this screen. And you can see that over the months, we managed to significantly increase vitamin D. And this was using vitamin D supplementation levels at the maximum that were allowed to use under EU regulations. So a couple of, of and we're now doing, this project is ongoing and, and we're, we're currently analyzing the immune benefits of, um, of this vitamin D supplementation. So the first line that increases there, you can see is we have a, a weather station in, in Grange where these calves are, and you can see that the sun exposure to, the, on the, to these calves increased. And shortly afterwards, we get, a, we get an increase in vitamin D, but also the dietary effect was significant in terms of increasing the amount of vitamin D. However, a very important point um, to make is that there was still this early period up until May of the first four or five months of life of these animals, where they're under this 30 nanogram per microliter uh, threshold that we think is important for immunity. So there could be this issue of vitamin D deficiency during early life in, in dairy calves that we can potentially uh, address and, um, and hopefully improve health outcomes. But a lot, a lot more work needs to be done on this. One of the... Um, cells that I mentioned that we're working on are these gamma delta T cells. And, um, and a publication came out from, from Jane Hope's group in, in 2014, showing that like all immune cells, they're not a single entity. There's lots of different subgroups um, within, within the different populations of cells. And within these bovine gamma delta T cells, there's a type called a WC 1.2. The detail is not important, but the, the 1.2s are what are called a regulatory subset, which means they are suppressive. So they, they prevent the mounting of an inflammatory immune response. And we see in these calves that we've, we've supplemented with vitamin D, we see significant effects on uh, the gamma delta T cell populations. So I'm just waiting for this data to come up here now so I can show you. Yeah, there it is now. So the first population, these are pro-inflammatory gamma delta T cells. So these will activate an inflammatory response. They are significantly reduced by vitamin D. Sorry, I'll just go back. Slide. Sorry, uh, one sec, it's not a bit slow for me. Do you want me to check here? Um, we'll just check, try this once more, Valerie, and we'll see. It says my screen is paused, why is that? Sorry about this now for everyone. Yeah. Okay, you can see that Valerie, yeah? Okay, so the point I wanted to make here anyway, is that the, the pro-inflammatory cells, which would be good for mounting an immune response against, say, tuberculosis, for example, they are suppressed by vitamin D, whereas the anti-inflammatory cells, which would be good for switching off inflammation, they're significantly increased by vitamin D. So, um, so we're seeing effects of vitamin D on this important gamma delta T cell population, which could have important consequences for the immune system and the response to infectious agents in calves. So a lot of research, as I said, has been done on vitamin D in the last, um, in the last two years, particularly, well, particularly in the last two years, but what they, what's, what's happening with vitamin D is, uh, or the, one of the emerging themes about the effect of vitamin D is its anti-inflammatory effects. 
And if you may, if, as I showed you in the earlier slide, the activation of interleukin-1 and this other cytokine called interleukin-8 is, is a major part of driving inflammation. And inflammation is associated, chronic inflammation in particular is associated with tissue damage and causes a lot of the problems that we have with, with animal diseases. So vitamin D could be potentially a useful tool to reduce um, oxidative damage and, and inflammation. So inflammation has attracted an awful lot of, ten of attention in human research. And it seems that uh, chronic inflammation um, it, it significantly impacts on, on mortality. And the more we hear now about inflammation is involved in, in diabetes, in, in mental health, and even um, um, we, we see now with COVID, that people that have a high background level of inflammation are more susceptible to, to developing what's called this cytokine storm. So other studies have using lar very large sample sets. Uh, there's a paper that looked at over 20,000 patients and they found that uh, low grade inflammation, look, looking at 10 different biomarkers of inflammation is an independent risk factor for total mortality. So it seems that the sum of inflammatory events that your body is under exposed to at any one particular time is deter determines the risk of pathological outcomes. So we think that the, the anti-inflammatory role of vitamin D could be very important in this regard, not only because the, the classical actions of vitamin D in terms of bone development, and one of the principal reasons for culling up cattle in Ireland is because of lameness. So we think even from a classical uh, functional point of view, the levels of vitamin D could be very relevant, but also because of the emerging roles of vitamin D in providing the correct nutrients for cells, which is called immunometabolism, but also in uh, reproduction functions that I'm not going to talk about today. However, there are a number of, of management um, um, practices that could potentially exacerbate the vitamin D deficiency that we see. For example, the increased amount of housing and, and the use of jackets, which are obviously good from a welfare point of view, but may reduce skin uh, uh, synthesis of vitamin D and, and needs to be investigated further. So the second part that I want to talk quickly about is, is the early response to, um, to intervening in disease and, and detecting uh, immune responses very early on. So one of the things we did was we developed uh, uh, an assay uh, for phenotyping the host immune response, because like I said, with other phenotypic traits of interest in agriculture, if you can't measure it, well, then it's very difficult to improve it. So from an early diagnosis point of view and identifying animals that are at risk of infection and also identifying targets that we can use to develop therapies against or to breed for, um, it's important that we can measure the immune response. It's also important because we have national selection policies where we're selecting for animals with reduced somatic cell count, for example, and we need to know the effects of that selection policy on the competence, the immune competence of the national herd. So we've developed this immunocheck or what we call an eye check assay. And this eye check assay is a very straightforward, but it's just a standardized immune assay, which enables us to profile the immune response to various different pathogens in blood. So we can take a, a, a vial of blood and we can we have a control sample and then we aliquot a, a sample to be stimulated with gram positive bacteria like uh, and gram negative bacteria and also with viruses. And that enables us to profile or develop phenotypes on the immune system um, uh, of these animals. And the idea is that we can identify animals which have a particularly high or particularly low um, immune response. So what we might call low responders or low performers and high performers. And importantly, obviously, to correlate these immune phenotypes with production and clinical disease phenotypes as well. Importantly, as I mentioned at the outset of my talk, we, the, the blood doesn't, isn't the whole answer because lots of uh, most of the infections we're interested in will originate in epithelial cells at local sites of infection. So we adapted another assay where we can take an ear punch from a calf or any animal like when the animal is being tagged, for example, and we can grow fibroblasts up in the lab and stimulate them with pathogens as well. In that way, we can profile the local immune response as well, which is quite a, ni a nice assay, not as standardized as the blood assay, but quite nice. Also, when you're looking locally, you're likely to have, in terms of diagnostics, you're likely to have higher sensitivity. So one of the areas we're looking at um, is using cervical mucus from cows early post-calving and we've been able to develop a protocol to identify inflammatory markers, like this is an acute phase protein here. And we're looking at panels of inflammatory proteins. We're able to pick up some animals that have hyperinflammation early post-calving, because we think and our, re our results to date would suggest that 
this excessive inflammation in the early post-calving period um, is likely to contribute to the development of endometritis. So really using these assays, using these uh, profiles, we can look at how the immune response varies across the production cycle. And we can identify windows of disease susceptibility where we can potentially intervene using management or nutrition, for example, to, to boost the immune response. At the, what we really want to do is identify what is healthy, what is a healthy immune response, what is meant by that. And then when you're outside those healthy ranges, we can identify um, you know, windows of risk. And then the, we can also look by profiling uh, individual animals. We can get a, a sense of what the inter-animal variation in, in immune responses um, is and whether or not there are certain animals that have uh, that, that struggle with inflammation or struggle with, with mounting an appropriate immune response. So there are many benefits of these assays, but I, I won't go through this in the, in the interest of time, but really it allows us to do lots of different profiling at the protein and gene expression level in a very low cost way. And, um, and we can longitudinally profile the same animals without the need for experimental infection. The third and final section then is just the relevance of understanding the host immune response to developing new effective therapies. And we mentioned this protein interleukin-1, which is an inflammatory protein. And we've shown in cows, in the uterus from cows that have endometritis, they have excessive levels of interleukin-1, this inflammatory protein. And we can pick up this inflammatory protein in the uterus even early post-calving. So some animals are mounting an excessive inflammatory immune response and they go on to, some of them go on to develop disease. And what we've done is we've used this Pfizer um, molecule, which has been, which is the molecule, the same molecule that Luke O'Neill has used in his research in humans. And we've, um, we've identified that by using this, um, this molecule, we can complete, you know, very significantly knock down inflammation in, in bovine cells. So this MCC950, which you can see down here, this is the name of the drug, and the drug inhibits the inflammasome, the inflammasome, that protein complex that I highlighted at the beginning of my talk. And by using this inflammatory, um, this inflammasome inhibitor, we can significantly reduce um, the amount of interleukin-1 produced by epithelial and stromal cells. So by understanding this, the molecular um, regulation of the immune response and identifying these targets, we can then intervene with, with new therapeutics to reduce inflammation in cattle. So what we're interested in is, as I, as I mentioned, as I went through, we're interested in what constitutes a healthy immune response, what periods across the production cycle contribute to heightened risk, what is the clinical association of these different immune phenotypes, and um, what inter-individual variation exists in the inflammatory response, and can we capture these immune phenotypes in a high-throughput manner that we can use uh, potentially to, to breed for disease resistance? So just in summing up then, really, the future for livestock health is a, it's a, it's a massive market. The animal health market is, is somewhere in the region of um, 70 billion US dollars. So I see this as a huge growth area and huge employment and research opportunities for uh, graduates within UCD, within, within our school. Also of interest was a report released by the Animal Task Force um, recently, which uh, the, the, the incoming president of the Animal Task Force is Frank O'Mara, the director of research from Chagas. And this is a, a government industry partnership. And they've identified research priorities, which has a heavy emphasis on understanding the immune response, particularly they say the interactions, synergies and trade-offs between animal welfare, the immune system and animal health to identify biomarkers of a healthy immune system, which is interesting, this emphasis on health rather than disease, and also to, to routinely collect immune uh, phenotypes so that we can develop intervention strategies which are not based on antibiotics. So in my, my take home message, I suppose, is that there's a critical need to expand research into host and comparative immunology and livestock so we can focus our interventions and our early diagnostics um, you know, at source in, in, in animals and in wildlife populations. Um, disease prevention depends on supporting the host immune response, uh, and that requires knowing what, what a healthy immune response is, and also on measuring the immune status of individual animals so we can identify animals that are struggling. Um, diagnosing and managing inflammation will be key to the control, not only of infectious diseases, but also metabolic diseases going forward. And I do think that immunotherapeutics are going to be, so, so interventions in terms of using those drugs against the inflammasome, for example, are going to be a major growth area into the future as, as um, to provide tools for dealing with disease. And particularly in terms of, I, I, I like the defenses in terms of driving the antimicrobial, but reducing the inflammatory responses 
in, in some animals. So I'd just like to thank uh, Chagas, the Department of Agriculture and SFI in particular for funding and our collaborators. Um, and a, a particular thanks to our PhD students, our postdocs and our farm, farm and technical staff who actually do the, do the hard work. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, th thanks very much, Kieran. That was really excellent. Uh, fantastic overview of your research work and illustrating how uh, basic um, research in immunobiology uh, can be translated to practical application in animal agriculture. So that's, that's really, really nice. Um, so uh, we have time for a number of questions from the audience and they can be um, directed to Kieran through the Q&A facility in Zoom. Uh, we have one question already um, from uh, Alex, uh, uh, Professor Alex Evans, head of the school, um, and his question is, what was the duration, uh, start and end of the vitamin D treatment uh, uh, in the calves that you showed uh, earlier, Kieran? It was a, a six month intervention, Alex, so we fed them for six months and uh, yeah, did our analysis during that time. And we're also, I didn't mention it there, but we're also doing analysis of the microbiome with Stafford, and we see some interesting changes. And, there hasn't been much done on how vitamin D modifies the microbiome. So I think that's a really interesting avenue as well. Okay. Um, so I don't see another question open at the moment. So if the audience can sort of uh, start their, uh, start inputting their questions. In, in the meantime, I, I just had uh, one or two questions, if that's okay, Kieran. Yeah. Um, so, so the first question I had involved, um, trained immunity, uh, which um, gained a lot of interest last year as a consequence of a proposed link between BCG vaccination and uh, some protection against COVID-19 disease. So I'm just wondering, um, is there a role for um, trained immunity in immunobiology of livestock? Uh, for example, I think it has been shown that BCG vaccination has a positive association with some production traits, uh, which would support the idea that it's kind of protective, a general protective have a general protective effect against uh, pathogens that might limit uh, production traits. Do, what, what is your uh, opinion on this, this idea? Yeah, I, I think, well, like from, you know, um, non, like, so one of the reasons that vaccines can sometimes don't work particularly well is because they haven't been optimized for use in bovine cells. So by using particular adjuvants in the past, we have shown this, that you can uh, um, drive maturation of the immune response using trained immunity in calves at an earlier age. So you can tailor the outcome of the specific outcome that you're looking for, if it's an interferon gamma type response, for example. The issue with trained immunity though, is, is, is most of the research, at least to my understanding, has shown that the non-specific effects will last maybe for the lifetime of that cell type, maybe maybe three months or so in macrophages, the, the results have shown. So the duration of protection from an age immunity um, might not be that long. But that's not to say that if in, the, in a calf, for example, you know, that window of neonatal immunity, that you could use non-specific uh, immunostimulators, for example, to activate the cells in a non-specific way to train the immune system to help them get over that window where they're re very heavily reliant on their innate immune system and waiting for the maturation of their adaptive immune system. So it could, it could still be a useful tool, definitely, yeah. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, we have two uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, the first one is from Colin Collins. Um, has anyone looked at culturing buccal epithelial cells as a way to assess uh, defense and uh, profiles? Yeah, so I'm really interested in oral immunity, Colin. Um, I think, you know, we did, a, we did a transcriptomic study before looking at um, cells in the salivary gland of mycobacterial challenged animals and um, I was really surprised to actually see that in the in the salivary gland epithelium we didn't find uh, any defense in expression but that's probably just because we were looking at the wrong cell type so not specifically buccal epithelial cells but definitely because of the vast majority of infections as we know are spread via the fecal oral route well then you know driving oral oral immunity and it is obviously a, a very important strategy and something I'm very interested in and with, with well, I talked about the microbiome a couple of minutes ago, and um, one of the things we do see is, uh, we, we, we did, or sorry, I talked about the microbiome, and we, we also took swabs from the oral cavity of these vitamin D supplemented calves. So we're comparing the oral and fecal microbiome and then the effects of supplementation. So I just met Stafford this morning, actually, about the results of that, so I don't actually have anything more to say on it, but, um, but definitely um, 
that the specific response of epithelial cells within the oral cavity is very interesting. Okay, uh, th thanks, Kieran, and thanks for the question, Colm. Um, the next question is uh, from John O'Doherty, Professor O'Doherty, uh, who also is an um, academic staff member in the school. Um, what metabolite of vitamin D is most effective? Um, what's in the MCC drug and how uh, does this compare to uh, steroids, uh, for example? Yeah, so, so the first question, um, we, we, used, um, we used vitamin D, uh, straightforward uh, uh, vitamin D to supplement the calves, but research in the US has actually shown that calcitriol, uh, calcitriol is more effective at driving serum levels of vitamin D. So you get a better response with calcitriol. So uh, if I was doing it again or in future work, I probably would use that metabolite. Um, um, yeah, but I mean, there's lots of work to be done. We're, we're measuring an inactive form of vitamin D because it's more stable, but it would be very interesting to look at the active forms of vitamin D, which you can do using more sophisticated techniques. And we should really look at, you know, are there animals that are more effective at converting the inactive to the active form of vitamin D, for example. And um, in terms of the MCC drug, what's in it? Um, I really can't answer that question. I, I don't actually know. Um, it was trialed for lots of different human conditions. And, and, um, and I think like targeting the inflammasome has shown really successful results for a range of human inflammatory diseases. Um, but how it compares to steroids, John, it's a good question, but I'm sorry, I can't answer it. I'd have to look that research up, I don't know. Okay, th thanks, Kieran. Um, and then we have a, another question, uh, an anonymous question. Um, and, and this question is, is, is a general question. Are there many job opportunities for graduates in the area of research in agriculture? And I suppose you're well placed to answer that, Kieran. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've over the last year in UCD, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of uh, employers of ag graduates, and uh, everyone is incredibly um, ambitious for the future. Growth um, uh, projections are, are very ambitious. Like we have to feed nine nine billion people by twenty fifty or whatever. So there's huge opportunities for graduates in in uh, in agriculture and. And because of that, then knock on consequences, like we see, as I said at the very beginning of my talk, Luke O'Neill presenting to, at a Chagas conference, like that there's an increased realization. I think, I don't know, I don't know, I'm biased, I'm very biased, but I think there is an increased appreciation for immunology and for understanding animal health in a more detailed way because we know that, you know, um, I, you know that, that uh, an infection in one species can rapidly become a problem for humans um, from, from bats and, and badgers and so on. So we need to, put a lot more emphasis on on non-human animals in terms of um, um, health and, and disease control. Yep, th thanks Kieran. And I would just add as well that in uh, increasingly um, graduates in other disciplines are finding research careers in agriculture, for example, um, people who have done degrees in engineering or uh, statistics, data science, computer science, uh, artificial intelligence, all, all of these areas are becoming increasingly important uh, in agricultural research uh, in the 21st century. O okay, um, we're just coming to up to 10 to, I, I just, I don't see any other questions, but I had one other question, Kieran, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about the uh, beta or the defense and gene cluster on chromosome 13, I think. Is that it's chromosome yeah. 13, I think, is it? Yeah. So um, I, can you detect um, the CNVs, the copy number variants using um, high throughput short read sequence data? Is that how you're genotyping them? Are you, are you genotyping them using PCR or what, what way are you doing it? Yeah, so it's with Ed Hollicks in the University of Leicester. He's developed some assays for typing. And, and just as you said it, the name has gone out of my head, the name of the assay. Um, what, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're doing, we've contacted uh, Donna and other people looking for whole genome sequences, and we have DNA from those individuals. So we're, we're mapping the whole genome sequences and using them as positive controls. But he has, um, he's published on human beta defensins and copy number variation. And he has, we're using, uh, Digital droplet PCR is one assay, but the second, um, I can't remember the name of the assay, David, it's gone out of my head, but he's he's published on this before for copy number typing in, in human defenses. Okay, no, I was just going to suggest because we're actually generating a lot of um, whole genome sequence data from hybrid African cattle, and it would be interesting to see, I don't know what the copy numbers are like in Bos Indicus cattle, but it would be interesting to see if there's any sort of selection 
uh, on, on those copy number variants in hybrid cattle, you know, that might be a consequence of the disease challenges they face yeah, in, yeah. in Africa. So I might talk to you about that, Kieran, if that's yeah, okay. Great. great, yeah, looking forward to it. Um, okay, I think um, I don't see any other questions. Um, I'll just maybe give it another couple of seconds in case anyone is typing as uh, at the moment. Um, okay, um, just one quick last question, Kieran. What about phage therapy? Is that something that people have started to think about with regards to animal agriculture? Um, using bacteriophage as a, as an antimicrobial, uh, you know, which is very a lot of interest in that uh, in Eastern Europe, particularly in Russia. Phage therapy. Phage, phage as in bacteriophage. You know, the viruses that infect bacteria. Yeah, I, th I think some work was done on that to deliver antimicrobials to the mammary gland of, of uh, cattle in Moorpark, actually, I think. But uh, I don't know too much about that, that approach, Dave, to be honest with you. So I'd just be speculating. I don't, I don't know. OK, here's an interesting question. Um, maybe we'll take this as the final question. And it follows on uh, from our discussion on the beta defensins. Uh, so this is an anonymous question. If the animals had different numbers of genes for beta defensins, does that mean they express the proteins at different levels? Have you looked to see if there are differences at the protein level between the copper no copy number variants, the, the different genotypes uh, in individual animals? Yeah, well, that's that's a very good question. I mean, we we are kind of working off the assumption that if you have more genes, you will have more proteins, but that's not necessarily true. But I mean, generally, you would expect that to be true. But it's a it's a one of the limitations of working in cattle is we don't have the reagents to work uh, for a lot of these new proteins. So, like I showed in one of my slides, we have to develop the antibodies from scratch, and we have to like um, validate them and everything. So. We have a small number of proteins where we can do that and maybe develop an ELISA as part of funding our research going forward. But it's it's obviously something we definitely need to look at, but um, we haven't. So the first, first step is to establish that, you know, what's the range of copy number variation available? And then the second one is, is that copy number variation associated with a trait that we're interested in, like immunity or like milk production or, or fertility in our case in that project, for example? Um, and then we will, we, once we know which copy, which gene we're talking about, well, then we can set about designing or developing an antibody against that protein and then validate that at the protein level. So it's definitely something that needs to be done. Um, and it will depend on how much copy number variation we actually detect uh, across these genes. But I have to say, there's a small bit of work from the USDA published in 2012. Uh, a while ago now, but they, they, these these the, the defensins are within the top copy number variable regions within the bovine genome. So I'm hopeful that a lot of them will be quite copy number variable. Okay, just one very very last quick question, um, because we, we do need to finish. But and again, another anonymous question: When you're selecting animals for immunity, do you want a heightened or decreased response? Yeah, this is this is the million dollar question, and, and we we don't really know the answer to that. We know there are aspects of the immune response, like I said, uh, like you know, we tend to think in agriculture. A lot of people think in agriculture, high somatic, low high somatic cell count is a bad thing. But of course, if you're fighting an infection, you want those cells to be called in to fight the infection. So, um, so cellular recruitment and it, which is essentially inflammation is a good is a good thing. But we don't want chronic inflammation. So certain animals may, like I showed you with the, the endometritis work, certain animals mount an immune response that's almost, uh, stratospheric is too dramatic a word, but they're much, much higher than, than say the average of the herd, her, herd would do. And then when you think about the, the multiple um, additive effects of having lameness, mastitis, um, endometritis, then they're all driving inflammation. Well, then you want to possibly intervene to bring that, in, in to bring, bring that down. But there's no singular answer. Like in humans, you wouldn't, if you had an overactive immune response, that would predispose you to autoimmune disease. If you had an underactive immune response, that would predispose you to chronic infection. So you like an immunity, really you want a balance. And that's why we don't we don't know that we haven't got that information in cattle yet. We don't know what the variation of a, of a healthy immune response is. But once we do, we can then say this: if I have 50 replacement heifers heifer number 101, she has she is struggling with her immune response. Heifer number 79, she has an inflammatory response. She's likely to, to cause me problems down the road. So within that way, you can select against animals that are outliers, essentially. Okay, thanks very much, Kieran. And thanks again for a wonderful uh, talk, really um, informative and, and really thought provoking. And um, so just before we finish, uh, just to um, 
just to so, so that everyone knows the research seminar series will be starting again uh, in the next academic year in September uh, 2021. And before we finish, I'd just like to thank um, two people in particular who've helped a great deal with the research seminar series over, over the last uh, 10 months or so. And that's uh, Valerie Abbott and Juliana Rocca, and also the members of the um, School Research Innovation Impact Committee uh, for suggesting um, speakers. So I think we'll leave it there and uh, we'll see you again for the research seminar series after the, after the summer. And thanks again, uh, Kieran. that was a great Thank talk. You. Thanks.